All right, so we are now recording again. Thank you for joining us this morning for our workshop with Katie Shear. Um, she's got some weather issues, so if we hear some funny feedback or we lose her halfway through, then we will improvise. Um, this webinar is being recorded, um, and so we will have that link sent out to you later, and it will be posted on our YouTube. Um, and uh, you have all been muted. Um, there'll be a chance at the end for questions and you can unmute yourself. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Katie. All right. Hi. Good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Let me get my presentation pulled up here. All right. Well, hold on, I gotta figure this out again. Let's put, so I need to share my screen. Sorry, guys. <laughs> there we go, that was what the issue was. Okay, and then we'll close that up and move it out of the way. Ah, that's not what I meant to do either. There we go, good morning. Hi, everybody. Ah, okay. So yeah, my name is Katie Sher, and um, I'm a library consultant. And um, I just want to thank all of you so very much for um, for being here and for dedicating this time to learning about trauma informed universal design and and what the principles of trauma-informed universal design um, have to offer to libraries, particularly in the context of programming to children and families. So we have a lot to cover today in a short amount of time. So we're gonna we're gonna dive right in. We are talking about trauma today. So. Um, I want to give a warning, you know, that that some of what we are going to be discussing could be potentially triggering. Um, I don't intend to get detailed in terms of describing specific um, potentially traumatizing experiences, um, but talking about trauma at all can be really, really tough. So please just take good care of yourself throughout this session. Um, my hope is that this will feel much more empowering than heavy um, and that you will all leave with some, some strategies that you can actually use to address trauma in your libraries. But everyone is coming to this session with their own individual experiences. Um, and so, you know, this is gonna be tougher for some people than others. Um, so just please know that I strongly encourage you to do whatever you need to do to take, um, to take the best care of yourself throughout. So I think it's really helpful to know a person's perspective in a session like this. So um, let me just tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. So I am not a social worker or a psychiatrist or a therapist. Um, I don't diagnose people or, you know, um, uh, do interventions or case management, but I am a library person. So I've worked in multiple positions in public libraries and I've worked with a lot of families and communities that were um, uh, really dealing with a lot of trauma. Um, and I still work with libraries all over the country as a trainer and a consultant. So I understand the challenges that libraries face, right? I mean, it's probably the number one thing that drives all of us crazy when we tell people that we work in a library and it's like, oh, that sounds so nice. That I would love to be able to be in a, a quiet place and just read books all day. And you're just like, oh, you don't know my job at all, <laughs> right? So I get the challenges. Um, I know what we do really well. And I also know where some of our blind spots are. 
Um, I'm also a yoga and mindfulness teacher. And so through that training and through teaching and through working with um, individual clients, you know, I've really learned a lot over the years about the effects of trauma on the brain and the body, that mind-body connection. Um, several years ago, I was part of a team and we worked to develop a trauma-informed mindfulness curriculum that was used um, in a school system in Eastern Kentucky. And one of my colleagues on that team was a social worker named Cindy Reed. And she truly is an expert in trauma-informed universal design. And much of what I'm going to be sharing with you today is influenced by what I learned through working with her. I'll also disclose that I'm a trauma survivor myself. So um, this isn't like about oversharing, right? Um, I disclose that because um, it's not something that I'm ashamed of. And I think being able to name those things and start to reduce some of that stigma is really important. Um, so I was diagnosed with PTSD in 2012, and this was after I stopped working in public libraries. And looking back, um, I can see and understand so much more now about how my trauma that I hadn't yet gotten help with was really affecting my work and my ability to um, to effectively serve um, my community. So this is personal. This is personal for me. I really wish that I knew more um, at that time when I was working in public libraries, but I am so grateful, so grateful that um, libraries are addressing trauma um, much more explicitly now. And I feel so fortunate to be in a position to draw on both my professional knowledge and my personal experience to contribute to these much needed conversations. So trauma-informed care is a massive topic. You could easily go to a week-long seminar on trauma-informed care and still feel like you're just scratching the surface. So I guarantee you will still have questions about trauma-informed universal design at the end of today's webinar. Um, it's just not possible to get you from wherever you're at to expert in an hour. And, um, you know, I don't even feel like expert. I'm constantly, constantly um, um, learning uh, as, as everybody is. And, and there's going to be so much to learn um, as we continue going through what we're going through now with this pandemic. So I do have goals, though. <laughs> you know, um, I hope that you all leave this session recognizing that there are things that we can do in libraries that support healing for children and families affected by trauma. So you may not know, you know exactly what that's going to look like um, in your specific context, but that's okay. There's no way to have all the answers immediately, um, especially for something so multifaceted. Um, but I hope that this session, um, that, you know, this is an introduction to a big topic, and I hope that it just, that it starts a conversation that you all continue internally, you know, in, this, in the state, in your individual organizations um, about, you know, how do we apply these basic tenets of trauma-informed universal design into our programs and services, you know, especially for children and families? Um, 
So before we move on, just a real quick note, you're going to hear me use the terms um, trauma-informed care and trauma-informed universal design somewhat interchangeably, but they're not exactly the same thing. And I'm going to go into um, into the trauma-informed universal design part of it um, here in a bit and explain that in more in more detail. You can also expect in this session that we're going to occasionally pause to practice just some really brief stress reducing techniques. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, talking about trauma is tough. Um, so we're going to uh, prioritize, um, you know, taking care of ourselves within this session just by having those opportunities to pause, kind of check in, um, and, and practice things that help us to reduce stress. So I'm gonna have a quick drink of water. And we're gonna start with an overview of what trauma is, how it affects the brain, and what is happening when someone is triggered. So what is trauma? The word trauma literally means a wound. Um, my colleague Cindy, whom I mentioned earlier, um, has the best definition is that, I mean, a definition that I really um, think is great to, to work from, and that is that trauma is a threat to the system in a state of helplessness. So working from this definition, um, trauma would be a person ex enduring an experience that they perceive as threatening to their survival, and there's nothing that they can do about it. And then the intensity and overwhelm of the fear and other emotions that are provoked by this experience aren't processed in the normal way, in the, in the way that um, our emotions and, and whatnot are, are processed um, when we're not enduring something traumatic. So in a very real sense, um, the physical memory and the emotional overwhelm of the experience gets stuck in the brain. And this is trauma. So many examples of harmful acts might come to mind when we hear the word trauma, um, such as violence or abuse. But trauma is also created by um, chronically ongoing stressful experiences that we may not associate with immediate physical harm. So for example, the toxic stress of racism that people of color regularly endure can be traumatic. Um, being separated from one's family, you know, through deportation or incarceration, or even the fear that that might happen um, can be traumatic. So Trauma doesn't exactly come from the event itself. It comes from the emotional overwhelm in the situation or the constant endurance of the toxic stress without a way um, to process through those experiences as they're happening. Um, and um, this is particularly one thing I will point out like that's really um, important to know for, for kids, especially um, if you've learned anything about trauma before uh, um, with kids, it's, it's probably around adverse childhood experiences. Um, and the research shows, you know, we know, it just shows over and over and over again that for children who are enduring um, trauma, the single most important thing um, for um, whether or not that becomes um, 
like a, a stuck, becomes stuck in the brain, becomes becomes this ongoing trauma um, that that can keep being triggered and then affect people's health and such, is if they have um, at least one caregiver. Um, so this would be someone in the, you know, probably in the family, in the home, you know, someone that they, that who is a caregiver who um, is able to, you know, help them, you know, validate their emotional experience and provide comfort and support, you know, in the, in the moment. And I bring this up because, um, you know, going back to this idea of it's, it's not so much about the event itself, it's, it's more about um, the, the emotional overwhelm of the event. So two kids can go through something that looks on the outside like the same experience that could be really traumatic. And if a, for a child who has a caring, supportive, um, loving, nurturing relationship with a caregiver who's able to validate and help them process their emotional experience is much more likely to make it through that experience without long-term trauma. So there's a quote from Dr. Gabor Mate, who is an, ex who is an expert in uh, both trauma and addiction, um, that trauma is not about what happens to a person. It's about what happens inside a person. Um, and I just think it's really important um, to point that out because there's no way to know from the outside how deeply an experience has affected someone. And in some ways, what we're all currently enduring with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic exemplifies this. So yeah, in some ways, we're all going through the same thing, right? But we're not experiencing it in the same way. And, um, you know, for, for some people, this is a more traumatic experience. This is a more triggering experience than it may be um, for others. And that's going to be really important to recognize in any public facing institution like libraries. You know, so members of our community are going to be dealing with trauma and not only, you know, members of our community, the, the families and kids that we serve, but some of our coworkers and even some of us who are here today um, are, are going, you know, are, are dealing with real trauma from, and, and the effects of trauma from this um, pandemic. And we need to understand that what is happening, whether it's to ourselves or, or a colleague or, or a family that we serve, um, that as a result of trauma is outside of that person's control. So what happens in the brain when someone experiences trauma and what is happening when that trauma is triggered, which is a word that maybe um, some of you have heard before. So the part of our brain that's in charge of our survival is the amygdala, and that's part of the limbic system. Sometimes this is called the old brain. Um, when we experience something traumatic, a threat to the system in a state of helplessness, the amygdala takes a mental snapshot of all of the sensory information that it can capture in that moment, all of the, the details that it can capture. And it stores that information away. So you can visualize this as the amygdala um, maintaining a giant file labeled danger, or even like, <laughs> like the amygdala is this uh, gatekeeper librarian, and the library is 
called Danger, and every book in that library is the sensory information, you know, from from the traumatic experiences. Just another another visual for that. So when something goes into the danger file or the danger library that the amygdala is in charge of, it's there forever. But that doesn't necessarily mean that a person can consciously access those details. So as we go about our lives, the amygdala is constantly scanning all everything that we encounter, all sensory input. Um, the amygdala is checking it out first before we're even consciously aware of that of that input and it's comparing that information against the information that it has in the danger library to assess whether or not we are in danger right now. And this process happens in microseconds. So, you know, um, there's a sound and before I'm even consciously aware that I have heard that sound, the amygdala has already scanned it. It's gotten that information. It's scanned it against everything that's in my danger file and um, has determined whether or not that is something that you know could be a threat. So everyone's brain does this, all right? This is not something that is, um, that only happens to people who've, who have had um, trauma, you know, and we all have varying degrees of trauma, you know, in our lives. If you get to be an adult human person, congratulations, if you've lived long enough to endure something traumatic, you know, <laughs> like life happens, right? Um, <clears throat> so everyone's brain does this. It's not a, it's not a problem. Um, but some people have bigger danger files than others, right? Based on, you know, just what experiences they've had in their life. So if the amygdala detects something in the current experience that matches up with something um, in the danger file, um, then it's going to take over the brain and this is being triggered. And the, these um, associations can be really, really, really subtle. You know, it's not like um, somebody attacked me and, you know, the only way that that's going to be triggered is if somebody attacks me again. It, it could be so many subtle things that the you know amygdala took that snapshot of and put in the in the danger file you know a, a sound a smell a color um a a physical place um and you know we may not even be consciously aware when uh when we're triggered you know when the amygdala has made this danger association of why it's being made but when it gets made the brain is now in survival mode and it immediately initiates um, physiological changes to prepare the body to do what it needs to do to survive so the hormones that are being produced are going to immediately change. The way the blood flows in our body is going to immediately change. Um, our heart rate, you know, um, is going to immediately change. Um, and you may have heard of this as the fight, flight, um, or freeze response. Um, and again, I'm just going to keep pointing this out over and over again. This process happens in microseconds and it's at an unconscious level. Um, so the triggered person may not have any understanding of what is happening to them in that moment or why. Um, but, but in this moment when the brain is triggered into survival mode, we can't access other parts of our brain. 
So parts of our brain that we need for um, learning new information, for being able to see, you know, what choices are in front of me, what would be the consequences of, of various choices, you know, how will things affect other people? We can't access those parts of the brain. Um, so when a person is, is triggered by trauma, they're literally experiencing in their body the same level of threat and urgent need for survival that they experienced with the original trauma. And they can't think their way out of it because that thinking part of the brain, it's offline. Uh, it's survival part of the brain has full control and the, the, that survival response that has been triggered is only going to start to fade once the amygdala um, again perceives safety. So this graphic illustrates what we see when someone is triggered, right? We see the behavior, the, which is that iceberg above the surface, above the surface, right? Um, and, you know, when someone is, is triggered, you know, behavior or things that we might see, that iceberg above the surface can be alarming or it could be disruptive or it could be almost invisible, you know, where we don't even, we don't even see it, but the response is, is happening. Um, you know, a person may become aggressive or uh, display really extreme emotions that seem, you know, not to match up with the current situation. They might shut down or seem to disassociate. But what we can't see, you know, we can see the behavior above the surface. And often what we want is to, you know, know ways that we can fix or change that behavior. But what we can't see is, you know, what's going on down below the surface. And oftentimes, even the person who's endured the trauma and is, and is in that triggered survival response themselves doesn't even know um, what is going on with that iceberg that's below the surface, you know, especially if they haven't gotten uh, the kind of help um, that they would need to be able to, to learn about that. So let's take a pause here. All right, this is, this is one of the places where we're just gonna pause and uh, do a little bit of stress reduction for ourselves. I'm gonna take another drink of water. <laughs> So we're going to um, do a really brief uh, therapeutic mindfulness practice um, right now. And this is something that's often taught in um, therapy like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, especially to help people with um, anxiety or panic. And the way that it works is it it helps us to come into the present moment uh, by connecting with our senses. So let's just start by finding a way that we can be comfortable. So if your body needs to move in any way after you know, sitting so you can feel comfortable, do that first. And we'll begin this practice um, with the eyes open. So begin by noticing and silently naming to yourself five things that you can see right here and right now. And now you can keep the eyes open for the rest of the practice if that feels good to you or you can choose to close the eyes 
And notice now four things that you can hear right here and right now. And now notice three things that you can feel with your body and silently name those things to yourself. Three things you can physically feel right here and right now. And moving on, let's notice and silently name two things that you can taste or smell right here and right now. And finally, noticing one thing that you feel grateful for right here and right now in this present moment. And if the eyes are closed, you can softly blink them open. Um, so that's a modified version. There's lots of different um, versions of 54321. Uh, you can Google that and find out more. Um, but that is a practice uh, that is very simple and very brief. And it's something that if it's done regularly, um, then it becomes a tool that um, can be used in moments of, um, of triggering and having that, um, that survival response to help bring us out of the survival response and back into uh, the present moment. It wouldn't work if we just tried it for the first time, you know, um, but it can, it can help if it's something that we, you know, do regularly comes a tool in our toolkit. And this is something that's really easy to share with families and with young kids. You know, it doesn't take very long and you never even would have to use the word trauma. You know, you can, you could just make it part of every story time. All right. So we're getting close to the end of our story time before we read our last book. It's time for us to do our calm down practice. And this calm down technique, if we do it a lot at home, um, grown ups, it can be a great tool that we can then often that we can then also use um, when there are moments of big emotions. So you never even have to use the word trauma and you can share something um, that can be practical um, and not only for kids, but also for the adults in the room um, who may also be dealing with trauma themselves. So when we learn about trauma and start thinking about some of the children and families that we serve in the library, you know, it can feel daunting, right? Um, usually if we are learning about trauma in the library context, we're learning about adverse childhood experiences, you know, and learning, you know, kind of to see behavior as um, communication and, you know, something that could be really frustrating to us in terms of behavior may be, you know, because of, of trauma. Um, and so, you know, just learning about that and seeing that. Um, and that's great. That is, that is, it, that is essential. It's really important. But, it, you know, you can leave that sort of feeling like, what do I do with that? You know, like, how can, how can I fix this? Um, so let's address this specifically. You know, what is and is not the role of the library? So the library can't prevent trauma in our communities, but we can learn about it and we can talk about it and we can work together 
in our teams to strategize, you know, how we can be sensitive to it. We can't cure trauma, you know, we can't make a, a child's uh, traumatic experiences go away, but we can integrate strategies that promote healing into our programs. And so what I just talked about with 54321, it's a very simple example, right? You know, we can't make everything go away, but there are things that we can just embed in what we are doing that can promote healing. And we can't guarantee that no one is ever going to be triggered in the library but we can adopt trauma-informed practices that help the library to be a safe space. So the image on this slide shows the four R's of trauma-informed care from SAMHSA. And SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And so a lot of the um, approaches to trauma-informed care are coming, you know, from these worlds, from the worlds of um, addiction, from the world of mental health, um, from the world of education also. Um, so these are SAMHSA's four R's of trauma-informed care, and we just spent time on the first one, which is realizing, you know, so um, realizing that trauma exists in our communities um, and talking about what that looks like, um, what, you know, how, how it happens and what we, what we see, that iceberg above the water. Um, trauma shows up in our libraries and it affects people and their behaviors in ways that they often can't control. And that's just really important to remember this, that when someone is triggered, you know, what's happening is outside of their control. So now um, we're gonna learn, um, we're gonna spend some time with that last R, which is um, how to resist the re-traumatization of children and families. And this is where we're gonna move into talking about um, universal design, trauma-informed universal design. So let's clarify what trauma-informed universal design actually is. First, just by talking about universal design. So universal design means that we, um, are taking into consideration the needs um, of specific individuals when we design something that's intended to be used by everyone. So um, it's not developing special things, you know, for people who, you know, are dealing with trauma, um, but it's thinking about the needs of people who are dealing with trauma um, and integrating um, the strategies and practices that are sensitive to those needs into our programs um, that are open and offered to everyone. And this continues to make our, our services beneficial to, to everyone, right? It doesn't take anything away from anyone. Um, so it, yeah, it just, it, it means thinking about our programs, our services, our spaces um, through this lens in order to reduce the risk of triggering trauma affected individuals without singling them out. So there are, like I said, um, many different fields that are embracing um, 
trauma-informed care. Um, and each field sort of has its own nuances. Um, so today I'm gonna focus on three principles or three tenets of trauma-informed care that, that run through pretty much every approach. And these are safety, empowerment, and choice. So let's first consider safety. Safety may seem obvious to us. Of course we're doing everything that we can to make sure that people are safe at the library. But some of how safety or the potential lack of safety is perceived by someone who has experienced trauma can be subtle. So that's why we've got this image of the brain and the amygdala specifically on this slide. It's just, it's a reminder that it's our amygdala and not our conscious thinking processes um, that are determining, you know, whether or not we're safe in any given situation. So people who have experienced trauma may need specific things in order to feel safe in an environment that otherwise feels safe to others. So think of a couple of things from the library perspective. You know, for some people, the presence of a security guard in a library might make them feel really safe. For other people, that might make them feel very not safe and really have them on high guard, have their amygdala on high guard, you know, um, just that vigilance of watching out to, to be sure that they are safe. That's just an example. Another example, um, you know, I, I think back to when I was a children's librarian, the last library that I worked at, I think about how I had my story time structured in the physical building. So they were in a meeting room with the door shut. And I always was set up at the front of the meeting room. So I could see the door, right? But the families who are coming in and hanging out in that space, it meant that they're positioned so, you know, if they're looking at me, their backs are to the door. They can't see the door. And this setup, it makes a lot of sense from the library perspective, right? Like, it, for, it, it's really helpful to keep the energy of story time contained in one space and to be able to see people when they come in so that we can greet them. And being super, super honest, with what I know now, um, having done a lot of um, PTSD recovery work, I can also see that um, my safety, my need for safety influenced how I set that up too. Because one of the things that I, um, often need and, and certainly needed at that time in order to feel safe, you know, is to be able to see who's coming in and out of a, of a room. You know, it, it will put my amygdala on high guard to have my back to the door. So um, when I think about that now, knowing what I understand about trauma, I have to wonder, you know, what that felt like for the families that were there, you know, and, and how that um, supported or um, did not support them being able to feel physically safe coming to story time. So I don't have a right answer here. Okay, I am not telling you if you do it this way, it's right. If you do it this way, it's wrong. I don't even know if there is a right answer. You know, there's so many different variables um, that are going to go into uh, implementing pr these principles for 
individual communities. But these are the kinds of questions to start thinking about and to consider and talk about with our colleagues when we're thinking about how to utilize trauma-informed universal design. So safety extends beyond the physical into the emotional as well. So for example, if someone has been traumatized emotionally by a public institution, uh, I don't know, a, a grocery store, a post office, um, a school, you know, um, whatever, a county clerk's office. If, if maybe they've been made to feel humiliated in, in some public institution because of how they were treated because of their religion or, you know, the, you know, how they present um, with their clothing um, or what language they speak, then other public institutions, such as libraries, you know, aren't likely to register as emotionally safe spaces. I've had the experience of being traumatized in, you know, um, in a school, you know, when I go into a, a library, I'm, my amygdala is probably going to be on really high guard and really, really vigilant looking out to know whether or not this is, you know, an, an emotionally safe space for me to be in or not. So one thing that, you know, when we think about emotional safety in the library, it might be helpful just to kind of reflect and ask ourselves, you know, who are we not serving? As in, you know, who is not coming through the library doors? And then is there a way that we can meet those folks in places where they do feel safe in order to begin to build trust um, and, and convey um, that the library is um, a physically and emotionally safe space as well. One thing that is um, powerful for helping people who have been affected by trauma, especially children, um, it, to, to feel safe, to bolster their sense of safety is consistency. So being able to reliably predict what is going to happen and when it's going to happen allows the amygdala to relax a little bit. And right now, a lot of you might be thinking, hey, okay, finally, yes, I can do that. And you can, it's true. Um, many of your programs for children and families probably already have a predictable routine that you use consistently where, you know, the kids and the families know, you know, this is what's going to happen and I can count on that, you know, happening pretty much in the, in the same way. We, we do this, right? Because we know that this reliable, consistent structure helps young children to learn. It helps all young children to learn, regardless of whether um, they've endured trauma or not. But it's even more beneficial for kids who have um, experience trauma because it helps them to feel safe. And remember, you know, feel if the amygdala does not feel safe, those parts of the brain that we need to access in order to learn new information, we can't access them when the amygdala is in control, right? So, Things that like having this reliable, consistent, predictable routine that promotes safety can help the amygdala not have to be on high guard. And now all kids in that room um, 
have access to the parts of the brain that can help them uh, learn and enjoy and experience what it is that you are trying to provide. So our second, we've just gone over the first tenet of trauma-informed universal de design safety. And the second one is empowerment. Um, so empowerment means helping people to learn about themselves, to learn to recognize when they have choices, um, to build positive feelings about various aspects of their identity, and to learn where to turn for community support when it's needed. So when we think about empowerment and universal design, this doesn't mean developing special programs that teach empowerment skills. That would be fine to do, but that's not universal design. Universal design would mean that we embed activities and materials and resources that support empowerment into our programs for everyone. You know, because, I mean, when you think about it, everyone can benefit uh, from these kinds of learning experiences, right? But for children and families in trauma, they're even more powerful and healing. So when you start um, exploring um, uh, just these various approaches to trauma-informed care and trauma-informed universal design, you'll find that they all emphasize um, doing what we did earlier with the people that they with that they serve, which is learning about the brain and how it is affected by trauma. That's really empowering, you know, to learn that these triggering responses that you're having, you know, they're not your fault and there's not something wrong with you. So that's usually in a therapeutic setting um, where people would start. Um, but learning about the brain is beneficial for everyone. Um, and it's something that we can do with young kids too. So I, um, I have a video, I, I'm not gonna have time in our session today to demo this for you, but on my YouTube page, which is on your resources handout, this exact video that I'm talking about, there's a video where I use um, a little plush animal, I, and we call this a breathing buddy, to help kids learn about their animal brain, which is the amygdala, and the thinking brain, which is the prefrontal cortex, and how when the animal brain feels like it has to keep us safe, you know, we can't use the other parts of our brain that help us to think. Um, and then we can, um, I, I let kids know, but there are things that we can do that help our animal brain to know that we're that we're safe and you know one of them is is practicing like mindful breathing and we'll get to that in a second but um so then you can take the breathing buddy and just kind of invite everyone to lay down if they feel comfortable doing that and put the little breathing buddy on their belly and just take take the breathing buddy for a ride um, because when you breathe in it kind of moves up and when you breathe out, it moves down. Um, so there's a, a video demonstration, like I said, on my YouTube page. Um, and this is great information for all kids, you know, to know, um, because it's, it's all, all kids have really big emotions and learning about the brain um, is helpful for everyone. And it's especially empowering um, for anybody who is dealing with trauma. Um, so something like this, um, it's not only, uh, you know, 
talking about the brain, but it's also then providing a strategy as well. Another tool in the toolkit, like our 54321. Um, there's also all kinds of other things that we can embed into our programs that build empowerment and also benefit everyone. We can talk about emotions and what they feel like and how to recognize them. Um, and so that might be another piece where you're thinking, oh, yes, another thing that I can do, right? Because I bet most of you could probably rattle off like 10 books and songs, you know, that you already are familiar with that are great for talking about um, or learning about emotions with young with young kids. Um, another thing that you're probably already doing, and um, we can always work to continue to be more intentional about that builds empowerment is making sure that we're using high quality, diverse books and, and also other diverse content like um, diverse music um, in, in our programs so that all kids and all families are able to see, you know, various aspects of their identity and their culture and their heritage positively portrayed and and celebrate celebrated. This is this is another way of building um, empowerment. So um, there's lots of other things, but the key the key point here um, is, uh, you know, that that we can take these these strategies that that help um, help people know about themselves and feel good about themselves and know what choices and supports are available to them in their communities and we can embed those pieces of information or those practices or those resources into our programs for everyone. So let's pause again for a moment and let's just do another, um, another stress reducing um, practice. I'm again gonna have a drink of water. All right, so we're just gonna take a little breathing break here um, and uh, uh, just kind of feel in uh, with what is going on in our in our brains and our bodies. So if you're seated on a chair, I'd invite you to scoot forward a little bit so your spine can be free of the backrest or not slumping. It might feel nice to roll the shoulders a little. You can uncross the legs and just have your feet flat on the floor. Hands can be wherever they're comfortable. And if it feels okay to you, just allow the eyes to softly close. You can keep them open if you prefer. And we're not doing anything fancy. Just feel your body breathe. So notice where is it that you feel the physical sensation of each inhale and exhale. Might be at your belly or your nose or your chest. Doesn't matter, just find the breath in the body and to the best of your ability, just let your awareness stay there, feeling your body breathe. So the mind will wander away. You might have questions about what we have talked about or be making plans or thinking about something from the past that's normal. Just every time that your awareness drifts off into a thought or a story, very gently see if you can guide it back to just feeling your body breathe. And we'll stay here doing this quietly for just a few more moments.
And at the bottom of your next exhale, if the eyes have been closed, I invite you to softly blink them open. So pauses like this are important because one of the keys to being trauma informed in our interactions with the public is being able to keep our own brains and bodies calm and being able to recognize when they are not so that we can do something that helps us to get to that calm or remove ourselves from the situation or ask for support or whatever it is. Um, because if we are in a situation where, you know, things are kind of amped up or chaotic or stressful, and then we're meeting that energy also with stressful energy, you know, because we're getting irritated or frustrated or scared or whatever it is. Um, you know, then that's, that's not going to really be the most helpful state to be in, in order to see this person or see this um, incident in a trauma informed way. So the more calm that we are, the more that we're able to respond from that place. Okay, so this is such a big topic. I'm going to try to move fast um, because I do want to leave, um, you know, a good chunk of time for questions at the end. Um, we still have a good amount to get through. Um, so it's really important to remember that a child or any person who has survived trauma is not broken. The brain can heal, which is amazing. <laughs> like, just, it, it's, wow, you want to talk about empowerment. That's incredible. So the process of building new pathways in the brain um, that can help heal some of the ways that the brain changes um, due to trauma uh, is called neurogenesis. Um, so, you know, how wonderful to know that there are things that we can do for ourselves that help the brain to heal. Um, all of these things on the, um, on the slide are the things that help to promote neurogenesis. Um, so these are things that we can do for ourselves, and there are also things um, some of them that we can take with us into uh, the library. So we can't meet for all of these needs, right? We can't remove threats. Obviously, if there's an abuse situation, you know, um, there's reporting that needs to be done. That's, that's a whole different thing. But, um, you know, we can't um, erase uh, the situations that might be traumatizing to a, a family or a community or a child. You know, we can't control how much sleep, you know, kids are getting. But we can provide um, experiences, uh, whether they're through our programming or through, you know, uh, things that are kind of passive that families and kids can do on their own that are, you know, mentally stimulating. Uh, we can build opportunities for, you know, vigorous movement of the body into our programs. We can um, implement brief age-appropriate mindfulness practices into our programs. And all of these things help um, the brain to heal. Um, and they provide benefit to everyone right so universal design where what we're offering is great for everyone but we're taking into consideration and intentionally implementing without singling out 
these things that are particularly beneficial for kids and families who have experienced trauma. So the last tenet of uh, trauma-informed universal design that we're talking about today is choice. And while all of these tenets, safety and empowerment, um, are important, um, I think choice is especially important because it can be subtle. So think back to that definition of trauma from earlier, right? A threat to the system in a state of helplessness. Childhood by its very nature is a state of helplessness in a lot of ways, you know? Um, children are dependent on adults for everything in their lives. And, you know, they can't, you know, go to, a, you know, go rent an apartment, you know, at five if something in their, in their home life is, um, is not safe, right? Um, so, so um, for these, for, you know, when, when, especially for kids, choice is really important because when someone experiences trauma, their choice has been taken away. Um, and so just the denial of choice or that lack of choice, feeling like I, 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 I don't have a choice in this situation, that in and of itself can be triggering. So let's just consider something as simple as an instruction like this. It's a very friendly library staffer, super nice person, and they're getting the group ready and it's story time. All right, everyone sit, come sit on the carpet. Hey there, friend. Everyone sits on the carpet when we do our story time. So um, come find your seat on the carpet now. I need you to sit crisscross applesauce like everyone else. So this adult is not in this situation is not, you know, attacking this person or trying to be mean or anything like that. But there's no choice in this situation in the way that the instruction was given and the language that was used and the rules that um, have been selected. Um, so for a traumatized child, you know, they're now in a stress response where the amygdala has taken over and their amygdala is going to make that child do whatever needs to be done for its survival. So that may look like the child leaving. It may also look like the child going and sitting on the carpet and following your direction because maybe obedience is what they have learned is the best way for survival. So it could look like, great, everybody's here and we're ready to go. But that child who's had their choice taken away, you know, their amygdala was in control. Do, do what you need to do to survive. Do what you need to do to survive. And this isn't a conscious thought, right? It's just happening. Um, that means that their parts of their brain were that for learning new information are offline. So they look like they're there but they're not reaping the benefit that you intended for them to, um, to be able to enjoy in the, in the program experience. Um, so, um, yeah, so this can be, the point here is that sometimes the language that we use and the rules that we select and enforce with the best of intentions can be potentially harmful for families dealing with, um, with trauma. So being trauma-informed asks for a big mindset shift where the family or child's need for safety, empowerment, and choice takes priority over our own need for um, control, organization, 
those kinds of things. And so for some folks, this can be a really, really big ask because it's scary to give up control. But we can just start by questioning how important is this rule, you know, and where are there opportunities um, that I can be flexible or that I can modify my language um, so that there can be more choice in this um, situation. So we're getting close to our end point and I want to also acknowledge in this session secondary trauma, which is also known as compassion fatigue. So secondary trauma is real and it occurs when we are overwhelmed emotionally by what we experience by serving other people who are affected by trauma. So whether it's a one-time great, you know, big thing or it, the repeated exposure to, um, you know, pain, violence, disenfranchisement, poverty, you know, these, these really difficult um, situations that we uh, see the people that we serve um, dealing with, um, our brains can become affected by as though we were experiencing that trauma ourselves. And so that's, that's what um, secondary trauma is. And if we have experienced trauma in our own lives that we um, haven't gotten the tools and the help and the resources to, uh, to work through, um, we're especially at risk for secondary trauma and, you know, for for being triggered ourselves as we're trying to do our jobs. Um, but it's not only people, you know, like me with PTSD who can develop secondary trauma. Anyone can develop secondary trauma. And it's not indicative of weakness or a lack of commitment to the job or poor job performance. So, you know, much in the same way that two people can go through a similar experience and one comes out traumatized and another doesn't, some staff may, you know, be doing essentially the same job and, you know, one person might develop secondary trauma and another not. So there's no place for comparing how people respond to trauma exposure in their work setting. What we need is to pull this experience out of the dark by naming it, knowing its symptoms, you know, this overwhelmed irritability, intrusive thoughts, physical pain. The, there's a, many different ways that secondary trauma can manifest. Um, so knowing, knowing what it is, naming it, knowing its system, its symptoms and talking about it, being able to talk about it, um, in the workplace without, you know, being shamed or, or having fear of reprisal. So that issue of secondary trauma is definitely something for organizations to be thinking about and, and talking about, um, at, the highest levels possible so that supports can be built in um, when folks need it. So as we end our time together, I really hope that you're feeling um, empowered, even though, yeah, the topic is really heavy. But by embracing these principles of trauma-informed universal design, there are countless op opportunities for pub public libraries to be places of healing in their communities. Um, so at the beginning of our session, I said that one of my goals was to prompt an internal um, 
conversation, right? You know, I hope that this sparks a conversation that you all keep going, you know, within your teams, at the state level, at the organization level. Um, and so these are some of the questions that I would, you know, encourage you to keep thinking about and, and talking through, you know. Um, so whether your ideas or your reflections from today are big or little, you know, whether they feel um, simple or revolutionary, the hope is that, um, you know, you'll, you'll be able to continue the conversation and um, take away from today some, some things that are simple and practical and actionable that you can, that you can truly do around um, safety, empowerment, and choice, and what that would look like um, in, your, in your library and your services. So, we are at the end. Um, I wanted to let you guys know just that I have an online class um, for developing a mindfulness practice. Um, there's no homework or tests or anything like that. It, it's, a, it's a class that helps people build an, a mindfulness practice step by step by step. Um, that starts on September 7th. So there's, you know, there's still spots available if people are interested in visiting Library Juice Academy to learn more about that. And these are all the ways that you can get a hold of me. Um, I'm really uh, off the grid pretty much on social media right now. So that's not the, the best way. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you, you can certainly feel free to reach out and send me an email or or anything like that to ask a ask a question or talk um going forward so here we are and the remainder of the time uh is yours and i am more than happy to answer any questions that folks want to type into the chat um if there's something that you for whatever reason, um, you know, want to ask privately rather than um, sending it to everyone, but still have it addressed um, just without people seeing your name or whatever, you can send it privately to me and, uh, or you can put it in the group chat for everyone. And yeah, how can I serve you? What can I, what questions do you have? everybody thank you for tuning in um, you can post a question in the chat or you can unmute your microphone and talk that way i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording